All right, hello everyone, welcome back. I know it's been a long time since I've made one of these. I've been uh, particularly busy at work, but I thought I would take a moment and do sort of a short video addressing some uh, very common creationist claims that I've seen. And so for this one, we're gonna talk about distinguishing models of descent versus common design for functional genes. Um, and we're gonna take some lessons from deep time phylogenetics. So one of the things that you might've noticed is anytime you see a phylogeny that is built for deep time, right? Not for very closely related individuals is that we tend to rely on protein coding genes. Um, and the reason that we do this is because protein coding genes evolve slower than genes that are not under selection, right? So it's very important that if you're going to compare organisms that are very deeply diverged, that you don't have saturation in your uh, in your gene comparisons, such that there has been so many mutations that you can no longer group them. Protein coding genes are great for this, again, like I said, because selection is acting on them and depresses how many mutations um, that accumulate between individuals. However, this poses a problem for creationists because they claim that functional elements can't be used as evidence for descent. Um, you might have commonly heard them say things like they could just as easily be used as evidence of a common designer because they're functional. They're actually doing something. So if they group individuals together, it's just because they were both designed in the same way. Um, and often I have seen people just kind of accept this, uh, accept their, their argument and try to get around it by using non-functional regions of the genome that are not under selective constraint. Uh, because they're going to go ahead and grant them this particular argument. Um, however, we can actually test this claim outright, and we can see if their intuition is true on this. So what I'm showing here is a phylogeny that I built um, for amphipods. These are tiny little crustaceans. They live all over the world, um, and these are families that are very deeply diverged from each other. Uh, their common ancestor likely lived at some point in time during the Jurassic. Um, and so millions and millions of years ago, and I used a combination of protein coding genes and ribosomal genes for this. So according to creationists, this phylogeny is total bunk, right? It can't be used because these are functional genes. So let's see, let's see if we can actually test this. Um, so sort of as an introduction, let's talk about what coding genes actually are, kind of what they look like. Um, I found this on the internet, just a, like a very simplistic sort of model, you can see there's a regulatory region that is upstream of the actual coding region itself. Um, and then there's a promoter. This is, you need a promoter anytime you have a coding region to basically initiate transcription. You can see transcription is initiated here. This is in the five prime UTR or the untranslated region. Um, then downstream from that, you get exons that are sandwiched between introns. This particular description is actually misleading because it makes it look like there are more exonic material than intronic, but for most genes in eukaryotes, the introns actually are a lot bigger than the exons, such that exons are very small um, and that are isolated uh, between large stretches of introns, but that's okay. Um, and then the termination region back here is just the other end of the, this is the three prime UTR. Okay, so for this coding region, what happens is mRNA comes, binds to the transcription, or the transcription factor binding site lands here, and then transcription begins. All right, and so what you end up with is they tack on this little poly A tail. Um, this is the, the five prime cap, it's tacked on here at the end, and then you get an exon, intron, exon, intron, exon. All right, and then a final poly A tail. All right, so this is important, um, and something to, point out here that's kind of interesting is sometimes what will happen is you'll get this, this uh, pre-processed mRNA is what this particular one is called before you've removed the introns, it's pre-processed. Um, if a reverse transcriptase protein comes along and captures this mRNA, it will reinsert it back into the genome. And we know, and like the human genome has many of these, and we know it because they still have the five prime cap and the three prime poly A tail. All right, so this is a, a, is a clear sign that these mRNAs have, have been inserted is whenever you find the cap and the tail still on the mRNA, as well as the, the introns, but no upstream promoter regulatory region. We have many of these littered across our genome, I should point out. 
Um, that's kind of an aside. But so what happens to this pre-processed mRNA? It gets processed, spliceosomes come along, and they cut out the introns, and then you finally end up with this nice post-processed mRNA that can then be transported um, to the ribosome for translation to occur. You don't get translation of this upstream region, including the cap. You only initiate transcription, or excuse me, translation at the start codon, and then you terminate it at this UAG termination or stop codon. So these ends end up not becoming part of the protein. Obviously, this is a functional gene, right? Humans have about 20,000 functional protein-coding genes. Uh, other species have more or less. Wheat has like 40,000. Um, some species, uh, uh, I think Drosophila has around 20,000 as well. Uh, it varies across organisms. Okay, so that's, that's the kind of functional thing that creationists will say you cannot use to compare relationships because it's doing something, right? It's building an organism. Okay, so a little bit more background that we need is on how can we model nucleotide mutations, all right? So again, thinking in terms of a protein coding gene where you have triplets or codons, these are sets of three that are um, first initiating transcription and then every single following triplet is then calling a tRNA to bring a transcription or to, to bring an amino acid. And then those amino acids are strung together in long chains and those chains form your proteins, okay? Now, in those triplets, you have what are called synonymous mutations and non-synonymous mutations. A synonymous mutation is those that don't change what amino acid that triplet is gonna code. The reason for this is that there's degeneracy in the amino acid uh, code. In the genetic code, there's some degeneracy such that the same, there are multiple triplets that will code for the same amino acid. Um, so if that happens, then it's called synonymous. And these most often occur at the third codon position. This is the one that's the most likely to not change the amino acid if it gets switched. In fact, there are some that are called fourfold degenerate. That means that any four possible base pair that can be in that position still gives you the same amino acid. Um, these are generally considered to be neutral mutations when they occur. Um, and this is important. This means that and, and this is true for most big-bodied animals, uh, most vertebrates, most eukaryotes um, that have, you know, don't have gigantic population sizes like Drosophila. Um, these synonymous mutations can be treated as neutral. Some exceptions ex uh, exist for things like prokaryotes, where the effective population size is very large, and you can have things like codon usage bias, um, which actually uh, we can find evidence for selection on these synonymous mutations. Um, and it tends to be because tRNAs are only prevalent uh, at a certain number, right? So if there's not enough tRNAs for, you know, to pick up that particular uh, triplet, then you can have some selection on this. But for our purposes, synonymous mutations are almost always neutral, um, and that's how we're gonna how we're gonna roll with them. Uh, Non-synonymous mutations, on the other hand, are decidedly not neutral. They're very rarely neutral. There are some genes where they can be neutral, but they tend to not be. Um, and this is because they are actually changing what the amino acid is that's being coded for. And this is normally when the change happens in the first or the second codon position. Um, uh, one way that we often compare this is what's called a DNDS ratio. Um, where DN is the change in, or the rate of change in non-synonymous, DS is the rate of change in synonymous. So you tend to expect there to be far more synonymous mutations than non-synonymous ones. And that's virtually universally what you find. Like I said, there is some exceptions, um, but you tend to find purifying selection, which is to say that you're removing mutations that are going to change what amino acid is picked up. That tends to be the norm. Um, okay, so finally, some uh, some mutation models. Uh, so these rely on estimating the rates of change between bases. So that's what I've got pictured here. You can see there's a rate of change from an A to a C, A to G, A to T, uh, and then the rate of change across all the other ones as well. This model is a very simple one called the Jukes Cantor model, and it's assuming there's a single rate for a change between every single one, between all possible base pairs. Um, this is not always true, obviously. So for example, different rates might exist for transitions versus transversions. 
Uh, transitions are changes of the same kind, like a purine turning into a purine. This is like an A to a G. Uh, A's and G's are purines, C's and T's are pyrimidines. So if you're changing a G to an A, that's a transition. A change from an A to a T is a transversion. So you're going from a purine to a pyrimidine. Uh, these tend to occur less likely, or these are less likely to occur. Um, and it's because the, the molecular structure of these two things are quite a bit different. Um, and so you just don't observe those changes at the same rates. So often you will see models that will account for the fact that transitions are more likely to happen than transversions. Okay, so a lot of this was maybe too much background than, than what you actually needed, but I just wanted to put it out there um, so that you kind of can get an intuition about what we're going to do here in a moment. So what we really want to do is a, a very simple test. Okay, we want to test whether or not the creationist assertion that what you expect to see in a functional region is common design and that it's indistinguishable from common descent, right? That's, that's what they basically claim, is that a model of common descent and a model of common design for a functional part of the genome should be exactly the same. You shouldn't be able to tell those truths apart. Okay, so let's test that. Let's see if that happens to be true. So imagine four species. You can say they're morphologically similar. It doesn't really matter, but they're four species that we want to build a phylogeny for, and we'll call them P1 through P4, uh, and here they are for a model of descent where there actually is a relationship between them, and then here they are for design, uh, with design being that these are independently created. There is no relationship between them. Okay, so now imagine we sequenced a protein coding gene, i.e. some functional gene, and we want to know, can we tell these two models apart? All right, so what we're going to do is a simulation approach. And what I did is I took a, uh, I randomly simulated a 9,000 base pair region of ATCs and Gs. And I use this as sort of the ancestral sequence for both models. So for both models, the ancestral sequence is exactly the same, 9,000 base pairs long. Um, I used a Jukes Canner model where we assume equal rates of transitions uh, between any possible base pair. Um, Non-synonymous changes, so these are changes that actually change the amino acid, have a selection coefficient of negative 0.03. This is a pretty high uh, selection coefficient. Uh, so these are, these are very deleterious. And then we have synonymous changes are a selection coefficient of zero. Okay, now importantly, these non-synonymous changes, I, this is a mean of negative 0.03. This is actually a beta distribution um, so that you can have some that are lower, some that are higher. There is a, a distribution of possible values that are being drawn, just as kind of an aside there. If you're interested in that, we can chat about it more in the, in the comment section. Um, okay, so for the design model, which is what I've got pictured here, we start off with four discrete populations, obviously, that have no ancestral relationships among each other. However, importantly, they all begin with exactly the same sequence. Okay, they all start with the same protein coding sequence that looks identical in all of them. And then we just let them evolve over time, right, such that from time point zero, we are here, and time point, this is 10,000 generations later, they are here. All right. Uh, and that's it. There's no, you know, gene flow, no breeding, no splitting, nothing. It's just they independently evolve. And that's, you know, basically what the design model predicts. Then we have a descent model where we start off with a single population, again, with that exact same starting sequence, the protein coding gene of 9000 base pairs. And then we let it split over time. And so what ends up happening is there's actually a tree structure that emerges, right? Individuals are related by descent in this model. So you've got the first split here, and then the P1 continues to evolve on its own. You have a second split here that leads to individuals of P2, a third split here that leads to P3 and P4. So you can kind of see what this tree should look like, right? P4 and P3 are the most related. P2 is an outgroup to them. P1 is an outgroup to them. Right, so there, there is a tree structure inherent in this particular model. Right? And this happens roughly every 2,000 generations, and then this last one is allowed to evolve for 4,000 more generations before we grab uh, sequences at the very end. And the way I do this is I just take one genome from one individual from each population. This is pretty typical if you're like building a big phylogeny, you usually use just one representative sample per species, right? 
Okay, um, and so this is what I did. I, I output the sequence data as a FASTA format. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with like sequence data and the different formats of sequence data, it's basically just a very simple format of ATCs and Gs uh, in, row, uh, in rows, right? Um, and then I constructed those phylogenies using Bayesian methods. I output the distribution of the best posterior trees. Um, and then I generated a consensus tree, i.e. sort of, you can think about it as the best tree um, from all the different posterior trees that were estimated. Um, so for those of you that are interested, I performed the simulations using SLIM version 3.6. I did the phylogeny reconstruction in BEAST2. Uh, this is a very popular Bayesian phylogenetic program. Uh, I analyzed the amount of phylogenetic concordance using a program called DensiTree. Uh, and then we are going to visualize our phylogenies using this, this very nifty program, fig tree. Okay, so what did we find? Are the trees different? Can we actually distinguish these two models? As you might expect, the trees are very different, right? They produce two very, very different trees. So let's walk through this. From the design model here, you can see there is no relation, like the individuals, P4, 2, 3, we, we don't really expect any topology. The topology doesn't tell us anything because they're not related. And then what's, and the important thing to remember here is that all phylogenetic programs are going to give you a bifurcating tree, unless they're like, you know, a network type program. Uh, they're going to force the data into a bifurcation, which is what's happened here. They're not related to each other, but it's forced a bifurcation to occur. But notice how little support these bifurcations have. Right, so this node is only supported with a posterior probability of 0.56. That is incredibly low. That's almost chance, right? And the same thing here. This is Both of these are very, very low posterior probabilities. You would throw these out. If, if you reconstructed this tree with those posteriors, you would not include this phylogeny in a paper. You would say this is garbage. Um, and then also look at how near the tip, right? It's very near... The, the 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 final node the common the you know quote unquote common ancestor there's not really a common ancestor here um, but it has to make one because that's the model forces it to make one you can see that they're all very close to to the tip okay so this is a tree again that looks very different from this tree where we do have a model of common descent and look at the posterior probabilities here. Right, we have a posterior probability of one for our most recent split of P4 and P or P3 and P4, a pro posterior probability of 0.99 between the subsequent split. Right, so this is a very well supported tree. This is not a well supported tree. Why is that? Well, remember these programs are under an implicit assumption that the data that you are giving it has a tree-like structure. Right, that they that these individuals are related by descent. Creationists point this out all the time that you are assuming common descent. That's what the, the models do assume that. But look, when you get these crappy posteriors, that means that the data you fed into it doesn't fit the model. That's what that's telling you, right? Whereas over here, we're seeing the data fit the model really well, like exceptionally well. This is a very well resolved tree. Uh, now, I want to take just a second to make a little bit of, a, of an aside, because another one of the things that you often see is that uh, whenever you're going back and forth about functional genes versus non-functional genes in phylogenetics, um, and the assumption is that you have to use non-functional genes because things like substitution rates become biased by selection and functional genes. And again, as I stated in the beginning, most deep time phylogenies use protein coding genes, okay? So we have a problem here that we need to address. So first, under neutrality, this is assuming no selection, the mutation rate equals the substitution rate. That's just bold, that's what it means. So if this is the rate of substitution, and this is the amount of standing diversity in a population, it's two times n sub e times mu, and then this is the rate of fixation. 1 over 2 n of e. You can also think about this as the probability of fixation if you've got a bunch of different samples, but we generally think of this as the rate of fixation. Then you'll notice that n of e cancels out, that 2 n of e, 2 n of e, these cancel, and what you're left with is just mu, right? So that's the rate of substitution is equal to the mutation rate. Now, if true, we can estimate divergence times following this equation. 
Uh, and what this is, this is the average pairwise divergence between sequence i and sequence j. And it should be equal to 2 times the time of divergence times the mutation rate. It's 2 because you have two branches leading back to the common ancestor, right? So you've got independent mutational processes happening on both branches. That's why you have to multiply 2 by it. Again, we can rearrange it such that if we want to isolate t, rearrange it by dividing the pairwise divergence over 2 mu, and that gives us t. All right, so what I've shown over here is the actual pairwise divergence that I estimated um, for the common descent data, not the common design because it wouldn't even make sense in this context, right? So for the common descent data, this is what I did, and we're going to look at specifically the rate of divergence or the time of divergence between P4 and P3. This is how much divergence there was, 0 0.0259. That's what pi i of j equals. Um, and so plugging that number in, again, for P3, P4, this is what we get. We get a diversion uh, or a uh, divergence state of about 4,300 generations. The true value was 4,000, right? So even with selection, we're pretty close to the real value. Now, note there's a lot of assumptions that go into this equation, tons of assumptions, including things like that this is a population at equilibrium, right? Which may or may not be the case, and it's probably not the case in this simulation. Right, but even still, we're we're pretty close to the real number. Um, so when people say you know selection is going to dramatically change the rate, it depends on how strong selection is. Right, it depends on how strong selection is, how recent selection was, what type of selection it is, etc. Um, but at least in our model, we are actually getting a date pretty close just by a simple algebraic rearrangement of the the value that we gave it. So if we plug in the mutation rate, and again, we're treating it as the substitution rate here. Uh, we plug that into our phylogenetic program and we tell it, okay, tell me the time of divergence scaled as, uh, or tell me the, you know, the number of substitutions scaled by the time of divergence. And that's basically what we're seeing here. So along the x-axis is time uh, in generations, I should point out. Uh, the blue bars are the highest posterior density. Um, and then the number is the mean. Okay, so the mean value for the for the uh, split of P3 and P4 is 4,300 under on, under this particular program. It's 6,028. The real value is 6,000. So you can see this one's very close. Um, this is the divergence of when P2 split from this ancestor. Uh, and then the final one is 7,100. Uh, this is about 900 generations off. So one of the things to bear in mind is that the deeper the node is, the more likely selection has had an impact on its inferred age. And that's just because selection has had all of this time to get rid of deleterious mutations, right? You've just got a lot more time for selection to have made an impact on your, on your timing, right? Um, but again, like I said, even assuming neutrality when it's not a truly neutral system, um, sorry, we can still produce relatively consistent results. All right, so now I want to show you, um, to me, what is the real nail in the coffin for um, the concept that common design and common descent will give you the same tree, or that are non-identifiable, that you can't differentiate between the two. This is the distribution of all posterior trees that were estimated under this model. Um, it estimated 10,000 trees total. I removed the first 1,000 as kind of a burn-in period because the posterior is still trying to like find the highest point. So you're, you, you can be biased by that original, uh, for that, from that first jump. So you tend to remove the beginning and you call it burn-in. So there's 9,000 trees here, 9,000 trees here. This is the design model and this is their distribution of trees. Look at this. <laughs> it's very clear that it, most of the trees are discordant with one another, right? It does not know what the relationships are among these. Again, remember, they all started with the exact same sequence, right? They have the exact same sequence, and it is a sequence that is under selection. It is a functional sequence, and it's under selection in exactly the same way as all protein coding genes are under selection. That is to say, there's strong selection on the non-synonymous and weak or non-existent selection on the synonymous, including linked selection in this model, right? And still, there is like no way to resolve this tree, right? If creationists were correct, this tree should look like this. 
This is a model where there actually is descent. And you can see very consistently it is able to find the true trees. Right? It not only gives you the right relationships, but the only variation you begin to see is sort of deeper in the tree. And it's just variation in time. Right, that's it. Not variation in topology. There's no variation in topology here. It's just variation in, in the time estimates. All right, so in summary, are descent and design models distinguishable for functional genes? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think we showed that very clearly that these two models are distinguishable. The difference is there is low posterior probability for design models. Again, because a design model does not match the underlying phylogenetic model. So if you took a bunch of organisms that were actually independently designed, put them into a model that tries to force them to be related to each other, it will do poorly. You will get very, very poor results, right? Um, high posteriors for descent models, even with very recent divergences, i.e. very few differences between them, right? We get, we get high posteriors. Um, and then secondly, the posterior distribution of trees in the design model is completely underwear, unaware of any underlying phylogenetic structure, obviously, because there isn't any, right? Um, and then descent models perfectly capture the underlying phylogenetic structure. So, going back to this tree, is it total bunk? Is this tree just nonsensical because we used protein coding genes to estimate it? Well, if you go along the nodes, everything that you see in black has a posterior probability greater than 95. That's a very well-supported node, and the vast majority of these nodes are very well-supported. That is something that you would not expect to see, as I just showed, if all of these organisms had been intelligently designed, right? If they did not actually share ancestors, but rather were independently created, then these nodes should be very, very poorly supported. And yet they're not. So total bunk, I don't think so. Okay, so finally, I just want to um, toss out there for those of you that found this interesting. Um, and if you're interested in like how these simulations were done, how the trees were built, anything like that, uh, if you're interested in maybe testing your own simulations, if you have your own ideas that you want to try out, if you think that this model could be made more complicated or more like if you want to simulate like an actual chromosome type structure or a whole genome or et cetera, et cetera. Um, would it be something that you would be interested in watching a tutorial or doing a live stream about? If so, drop a comment and I'll try to put something like that together. Um, I think Simulations in evolutionary biology are super important. They allow us to test hypotheses like this um, in ways that you can't do on empirical data, right? Because we need to do a model where we know what the answer is, right? Um, and so you can simulate it, uh, and then you can test two different models because you know what the true answer should be. So again, if you found this interesting, uh, if you want to see the code, if you want to see more details about the programs I used, anything like that, feel free to drop a comment and I'll be happy to get back with you, share the code, um, we can talk through it, etc. cetera. Um, so with that, thanks for watching. Um, I hope you have a great day uh, and I'll see you next time.